stand here. So, okay. Welcome everybody. Glad you could make it this evening. Quick question: Is anybody exceptionally warm? And, and don't look at me because I I just sweat. Okay. We will see if we can turn it down a little bit. It gets kind of stuffy in here with all these people. This is fantastic. Glad you're here. Uh, my name is Andy Saner, as some of you may, may know. Uh, you're at the Lunar and Planetary Institute uh, here in Houston. Uh, and tonight is our, what is this? This is our fourth presentation in our current public lecture series, uh, Exploring the Solar System Today and Tomorrow. Our final and fifth presentation will be on June 2nd uh, with Dr. Alan Tremor from here at LPI, giving us an update on where things are at with the Curiosity rover on Mars. And he's going to talk about the tires. Or the wheels, I guess. <laughs> so, so if you've been hearing about that, you're gonna you're gonna hear some more of that at that time. Uh, a couple of things you may have seen on here, I want to uh, just kind of reiterate. On May 9th, there's a transit of Mercury, which means you'll be able to see Mercury going across the face of the sun slowly, but you can see it. We're gonna have a telescope set up at the Freeman, Freeman Branch Library uh, from 10 to noon that day, as long as it's not cloudy. Uh, so you're welcome to come out and see the transit as it's happening. It's kind of a cool. Kind of cool little thing to see. Plus, you get to see the sun, which <laughs> up close. Bring your sunglasses. Uh, uh, one of our scientists, David Kring, who you've probably heard speak before, he'll be giving two presentations at the Houston Museum of Natural Science May 24th and June 30th as part of their lecture series out there. Uh, so if you want to, there's a flyer set out front if you want to go see that. He's a good presenter, too. You got to buy tickets, but that's their thing, not ours. Um, but those should be good talks uh, if you want to go here. One's about uh, lunar exploration. The other one's talking about the threat of asteroid impacts. So a fun one and then a scary one to, to balance it out. Um, and on the flyer, it says that it'll be in the planetarium, and that's true. If you look at it online, it says it'll be in their big theater. We just found out recently that they're going to do it in the planetarium because they just overhauled the system and got this nice, great new system in there. So they're going to do it there instead. Uh, at the end of tonight's presentation, of course, we'll have a Q&A session. You can ask your questions if you have it. If you do, please raise your hand. There'll be two of us going up and down the aisles there with a the microphone. Uh, that's so, of course, we all can hear it, but we're also recording. We're also streaming live on Ustream, which we did uh, the last presentation. So again, manners, uh, I, I beg. Um, oh, and of course, whoa. <laughs> Let's just do this. Uh, there's a reception, of course, following afterwards, chance to chat with uh, our tonight speaker, Dr. Bagano. Uh, but first, I'm going to sit down and have Dr. Paul Shank come up. He's one of our scientists. You've heard speak about Pluto and Dawn, and he's going to tell us more about tonight's speaker. And then remember to turn the lights down. Welcome, welcome. Uh, we're going to talk about Jupiter today, and um, I'm going to introduce Dr. Fran Baganel, who I've known since I think Dirt was young, I think. Uh, and I asked her over dinner to, to tell me what she wanted me to tell her, tell you about her. And this is it. Grew up in England, came to the U.S. as a graduate student at MIT for a year, but got involved on Voyager, and that was it, okay? Um, <laughs> but there's actually a lot more to it than that. She's been involved and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think every spacecraft mission to the outer solar system since, Vo uh, since Voyager days, which was in the 1980s, uh, I, I don't think that, that we've actually missed any of those. And she's been studying the small microscopic particles that get blown off by the sun and sweep through the solar systems, known as the solar wind, and how they interact and populate the magnetic fields of the giant planets. And and she's been working on Voyager. She worked on Galileo, which orbited Jupiter, Cassini, which is still orbiting Saturn. And just this past year, uh, New Horizons at Pluto, um, which has uh, some interesting things that we discovered there as well. And now on Juno. And she's going to tell us about what Juno is going to do at Jupiter. And she's actually complained to me that uh, uh, she helped write a book about uh, Jupiter, which was published in 2004. Uh, ironically called Jupiter, and she's now going to have to rewrite that book because of the discoveries of Juno. So uh, I give you Fran Bagano. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much indeed. And it's really exciting to have flown past Pluto. Wasn't Pluto cool? The New Horizons stuff? 
absolutely amazing stuff. To go from um, Pluto last July to flying past, going into orbit, uh, we hope, around Jupiter on the 4th of July with the Juno mission. So I'm going to tell you about the Juno mission, what we hope to do, and why it's important for solar system exploration, and in fact understanding how the solar system formed, how different solar systems formed, maybe around other stars and so on. So let's start off with our usual idea of what the solar system, big planets are involved. Uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, uh, two pairs, Jupiter and Saturn, 10 times the size of the Earth, uh, 100 to 300 times the mass, uh, and then Uranus and Neptune are more, a few times Earth masses, uh, uh, 20 or so Earth masses, and about a few times the size of the Earth. But we're really interested in Jupiter, the biggest one, 300 times the mass of the Earth, and how it forms, uh, it plays a role in the formation of the solar system. It's the big planet of the solar system. So these are pictures that were taken by Voyager and by Cassini, improved cameras over time, and Cassini was able to take a really fantastic view and put together, once we map it out in the latitude and longitude scheme, we can then look at the movie showing the clouds moving back and forth. And you can see uh, the east and west flowing winds, the white ones going one way, the red ones going the other, and of course the great red spot, which has been observed since we first put up telescopes to look at the sky since Galileo's time. We know that the great red spot has been there. So what are we really looking at? Well, what we're looking at is the outermost layers of a planet, and uh, the, the white clouds, we're seeing reflected sunlight, uh, all uh, all colors of the of, of the spectrum. And when we're looking at the red ones, we're seeing clouds that tend to absorb in the blue part of the spectrum and reflect red. And we think it's sulfur that's causing most of that reddening uh, of, of the, those clouds. We believe there are three layers of clouds, an outermost layer that's uh, uh, ammonia, uh, ammonia particles that form clouds. Uh, the middle one is a mixture of ammonia and sulfur, ammonia hydrosulfide. And the bottom one, we believe, we can't see it, is uh, water deeper down. Now, what are we really looking at? Well, what we're really looking at is a big gas bag. This is a gassy planet. It doesn't have a surface. And what we're looking at is the way um, things work at the giant planets and a lot of the planets around other stars is that if you add gas and you add more gas, it's a bit like a stack of pillows. And you keep, um, you've got pr mass pushing down, so you have more pillows, you've got more mass. So at the bottom, you've got more deeply compressed material and then less compressed up here. So pressure is increasing with depth, just as our atmosphere is, is down near sea level versus up at the top of Everest, you've got much less uh, pressure at the top of Everest. It's the same sort of thing. And this is really all just gravity pulling down on gas as gravity pulls down on pillows. So if you add more pillows to your pile, what happens is it doesn't increase in height by one pillow's worth. It gets compressed down. And so what we find with the giant planets is that they end up, Jupiter and Saturn being more or less the same size, as are many of the planets around other stars, you're just adding more material and they get more and more dense inside. And so Jupiter is three times the mass of Saturn, but it's more or less the same size. There's not a lot of difference in size. Okay, so let's think about the outer layers, what we're seeing. Well, we see have the same sort of situation as we have here on Earth when we have uh, gas is rising up, they condense, but because spin, the Jupiter spins every 10 hours, rotation plays a major role, Coriolis force is important, and you end up turning that rising motion into east-west winds. And so we have these belts and zones, as they're called, when you look at the planet. So if you look with the telescope, and I encourage you when you um, to go out now is a very good time. We have Jupiter high in the sky when it's not cloudy. You can see it clearly, and you can see with a, a relatively small telescope the, the belts and zones. Now, if you look with an infrared telescope, 
you can look at the hotter parts deeper down beneath, but between the clouds and the colder parts look black higher up. So it's sort of inverse of what you see in the visible part of the spectrum. What you're seeing in the infrared is the internal glow trying to get out. And this will be an important thing when we start talking about Juno science. Um, okay, so we have these white ammonia clouds, ammonia hydrosulfide clouds, uh, are the yellow ones below. And of course, the great red spot is a big storm system um, that we've been observing since Voyager time in detail uh, and seeing it swirling around. It's a high-pressure system in the southern hemisphere. We can take our observations of Cassini taking the equatorial plane and project them onto the pole, and we see these belts and zones consider, uh, continuing up towards the poles, uh, but we don't really we don't have information in the actual polar region. This uh, movie is kind of cool, and it shows you these belts and zones continuing quite a long way up, but we don't really know if they continue to the very polar region because we haven't flown over the poles. Now, we wanted to know what was inside Jupiter, very important for understanding the formation of the solar system, as I said, and we wanted to know what the cloud system was like. So uh, the Galileo mission sent a probe into the atmosphere in uh, 1995. And so what we expected to see with this probe that went in, we're measuring all the weather parameters, was we'd expect to see these three layers of clouds as it went in. But what we actually saw was very little, virtually no clouds at all. So what on earth was going on? Well, what was happening was, in fact, that where the probe went in was between, luck would have it, it went between these cloud layers, right? And so when we look at where it went in using the infrared, uh, an infrared telescope, this doesn't seem to have come out very well, um, but it, it, where it went in was uh, actually in a hot zone, which was a downdraft region um, where we were between the clouds. Okay, so why do we really care about the clouds of Jupiter? Well, it has to do with understanding how the solar system formed from a big um, cloud of gas, uh, material con condensed out to form the core of the planet and then um, gas being entrained into Jupiter. And so what we thought was that when you look at the abundance of elements, the main um, principal uh, highly abundant elements, we expected that the um, uh, the inert gases, helium, neon, argon, krypton, and xenon, um, what we see is that they're all enhanced by about a factor of three over the sun, over the solar abundance. And so we suggested that that was the sort of uh, abundance of material that was being pulled in uh, to make most of Jupiter. But then when we look at carbon and nitrogen, the yeah, it's consistent, sulfur consistent, but we didn't see any water. So if you take oxygen, the third most abundant element in the universe, you'd expect there to be a lot of it in Jupiter. You add oxygen to hydrogen, the most abundant element, you get water, right? So if we don't see water clouds, where is the oxygen? And what's going wrong with our theory of the origin of the solar system? So to keep things simple, astronomers have this periodic table. And um, <laughs> hydrogen, helium, and oxygen is number three. And, and as I say, if we can't get oxygen right, um, then we really don't understand how the formation of the solar system works. So um, this is our idea. We think that as this gas collapsed, it was um, hot inside, close to the star. And the low abundance, let me just go back to that um, table, you can see the things that make up rocks are very low abundance. And so rocks and iron, um, we know then that we make small rocky planets in the inner solar system, and we make large giant planets that form outside this snow line where we think large snowballs accumulated of the material that condensed the water, a bit of ammonia, methane, nitrogen, CO, but mostly water form these huge snowballs. Once you get a snowball that's about 15, 20 Earth masses, 
you start pulling in the gases that are there, particularly hydrogen, and you make a big gas giant. Okay, so this is our idea that we've had for many uh, decades now of how the solar system formed. But if we go to Jupiter and find there's no water, or we're lacking water, what on earth is going on? What is wrong with our theory of how gas giants form? So this was a motivation to go back. And you might say, well, let's just send a whole bunch more probes and maybe end up going into the wrong place, in which case you're stuck and you don't really know. Did you go to the wrong place or, or, uh, or did you just, uh, are our theories wrong? So what we decided to do was to find a new approach. We were going to go and look for water, but not by sending probes in, by sending a spacecraft that gets really close. And I'll show you uh, in a bit how we're going to measure it. So it turns out that we, um, there were not, there wasn't uh, enough plutonium um, 238 around to make uh, radioisotope thermoelectric generators. We had to come up with a new way of powering our spacecraft. And we decided to use solar panels. And these are the large solar panels uh, that we have on Juno. And so this is our spacecraft. Here is a human, right, down here at the end of the solar panel. This is a 60-foot diameter, okay, uh, really large uh, solar panels that provide about 200 watts of power out at Jupiter, where, of course, the sun is about 25 times weaker than it is here at the Earth. Uh, but that should be enough to power our spacecraft. Our spacecraft uh, has a variety of instruments, a magnetometer, the end of the boom, a couple of energetic particle instruments, Jade and Jedi. Uh, we have a, uh, a wave instrument that will measure plasma and radio waves, a couple of spectrometers, a UV spectrometer, an infrared spectrometer, <coughs> uh, and we have a microwave instrument that will measure microwaves, and that's going to be very important for measuring water. Uh, gravity science will be uh, using the radio antenna to measure um, motions of the spacecraft that tells us about the gravity of Jupiter. Oh, and yeah, we've got a little camera. Yeah, we threw that on. Um, it's a, a PR instrument. So, you know, in, in, in space exploration business, as you probably know, the cameras rule because the public relations and everybody wants to see the pictures of what's going on. Mars, the rover. Getting stuck in the sand. <laughs> Those of us who measure charged particles and magnetic fields and gravity waves, you know, we have to put up with the spacecraft being pushed around to take all the pictures. And we're, if we're lucky, please can we make a measurement? Please can we make a measurement? And the cameras let us make a measurement occasionally. Um, on this spacecraft, we will tell the cameras where they're pointing and what they're going to see. And uh, we will make our measurements. And if they're lucky, they will get a picture to show to the public. <laughs> I exaggerate, of course. But um, it will take some really cool things. But uh, it's a spinning spacecraft. And so you can imagine the spacecraft that is spinning every 30 seconds, um, you're not going to be able to turn and move and target things. Um, very easily, but there will be some choice about what we're going to observe. Okay, we'll come back to the camera later. Okay, in the meantime, in order to make the measurements that we want to make, we have to get very close to the spacecraft. Sorry, we have to get very close to Jupiter, to the to the planet, and that means we have to go into the radiation environment, which I'll show you in a minute. And so, when we built the spacecraft, we um, put all the electronics, or most of the electronics that we could inside a vault with a really thick titanium um, encasing to protect it. Because this is what we are going to have to do. So here's Jupiter, and around it, there are very strong radiation belts. These are like the Van Allen belts of the Earth, but more intense, more dangerous. Uh, these are 10 MeV electrons, which are very energetic, penetrating charged particles that will, if they go through your electronics or through the skin of a human, uh, for that matter, we're not taking humans here, by the way, um, 
Uh, but the electronics get very easily get damaged by um, these charged particles. And so we are trying to protect the spacecraft. We've designed our spacecraft, our, our mission, our orbit, to go over the poles, duck under the radiation belts, above the clouds, and then back out again. And it takes about, um, it takes about two hours to go from pole to pole. It's moving at 60 kilometers a second. It's really moving fast over here. And then it spends two weeks out here sending the data back to the Earth. And then we do it again, and so on. So that's great. Very well designed. Uh, trajectory. The only problem is Jupiter spins every 10 hours, so rotation is really important. And so it's actually much fatter at the equator than the poles, about 10%. So this ablateness, this flattening, this equatorial bulge uh, causes the orbit to go from here in the equator, starting dipping down. And after 16 orbits, it's dipped down here, and by 30 orbits, it's dipped all the way down. And so you can see, after uh, a dozen, two dozen, maybe three dozen orbits, we're going to be going right through the middle of this lethal radiation environment. So we don't know how long this spacecraft will survive. If we only get 10 orbits, we'll learn a huge amount about Jupiter. Uh, but we're hoping that we will go for 30 or so orbits and survive, but we just don't know. It's a new environment, new world. We just don't know what that um, will be for our spacecraft. Okay, so that's the plan. And what we're going to do is we're going to uh, map out the planet. We're going to design our orbit so that we uh, scan different regions. We come back at different longitudes and measure uh, the environment around Jupiter at these different longitudes. Are we going to do this in a variety of ways? The first thing we want to do is to measure the distribution of mass inside Jupiter. And to do that, we want to measure the gravity. Now, this is done a lot with various space missions. And there have been missions, say, say you have a planet that has rock, and you have a big mountain here. If you have a spacecraft flying over that mountain, the gravity will be put stronger over the mountain if you like pulling the pendulum or um, pulling on the spacecraft as it goes over the mountain. And so we can map out the gravity as we've done for the Earth in gory detail. Really quite impressive what the, um, the Gray spacecraft has done at the Earth and the Grail spacecraft has done on the Moon measuring the distribution of mass. You can see the impact craters and how this affects the mass uh, on the Moon. Now, the way we're going to do this is as follows. We use the radio antenna that has a transmission uh, back to the Earth. And as the spacecraft goes along, if there's a uniform gravity, the spacecraft is not very much perturbed on its orbit. But if there's a gravity inside that perturbs a detailed structure, it'll make the spacecraft wobble, and there'll be a detectable Doppler shift in the radio signal that's being sent back to the Earth. And so we use this. Uh, Doppler shift to tell us about the gravity, the distribution of mass inside. And the way we do this in space science is to measure uh, the power as a function, which is a vertical scale here, versus complexity. The higher the this uh, number is along here, the greater the degree of complexity. So the low order structure that happens over most of the planet will have a low number. <laughs> But if there's a small scale structure that happens at one region or another, it'll be at the higher number here. So for Jupiter, we've only measured the very low order, uh, very high power structure. And what we hope to do is to measure, and this red line is just a, a wishful thinking of a theorist that says that we'll be able to measure the power at very high uh, order, which will give us the complexity, the detailed distribution of mass inside Dr Jupiter and this will tell us where the mass is and what's going on inside. OK, so what we think is inside these gas bags, Jupiter and, and the other giant planets, is we have this idea there might be a core deep inside. We have an idea that um, we have uh, hydrogen above that and, and it much denser deeper down. So. Um, I'm sh I'm showing that I um, these 
figures are being, um, I, maybe there's a translation with this projector, but let me talk you through what we're seeing here. The density here is low up high, and compared with water, so this is about the density of water, one, we get down to a density about of rocks and really dense metals deep down inside. And this is because of the gravity pulling down on the gas. And the temperature rises up to about uh, five times, four, four to five times the temperature of the surface of the sun. So it's really hot inside because of the high pressure. Now the temp, the pressures uh, are very high. In fact, the number that you can't read here is a hundred million times the atmosphere of the Earth. So what do these pressures actually mean? Okay, so I'm going to tell you what that means. When we talk about pressure, we're talking about weight or mass being pulled by gravity. And I have a certain weight, more than I should have, but I have a certain weight, and I can feel the force of gravity through my feet. And there's a pressure through my feet, and I can calculate that pressure as my mass times the force of gravity per unit area of my feet. Okay, so what happens to the pressure, pressure is force per unit area, if I stand on one foot? What happens to the pressure? Does it go up or down? Uh -huh. By a factor of? Two. Right, I've halved the area, and so um, I've increased double the pressure. Okay, so in order to talk about the pressure of the gas in this room, you have to have five people standing on my shoulders above me and all that weight coming through my feet. That is the pressure in this room. You can do the math to check. It doesn't seem credible because we're so used to it, right? We're used to that pressure. But if you were out in space, and your spacesuit was evacuated, you would suddenly realize, yeah, you're used to a lot of pressure that is going away. Okay? So that's the pressure in this room. What about the pressure deep down inside Jupiter? What's it like there? Well, we can't use humans. So, uh, how about elephants? Okay, so let's have an elephant. Okay, let's have an elephant standing on one foot. Nah, not enough. You need a thousand elephants standing on top of each other and the bottom elephant standing on one foot on a stiletto heel. <laughs> <laughs> and then you begin to get the right sort of pressures, right? Sort of a, something like 50 to 100 million bars times the pressure in this room. So we don't really know how hydrogen behaves at those pressures. I mean, we can't write a proposal to NSF saying, could I have a thousand elephants? I want them to stand on each other with the bottom on the side of here. Even um, Lawrence Livermore and the uh, places that study hydrogen at high pressure, gee, maybe related to hydrogen bombs, maybe? I mean, I don't know, but I would guess that they maybe know about this stuff. Uh, they don't get to these pressures, okay? And so... We are sort of making it up. We don't really know. We're working on a realm that we do not have experimental evidence. And so we have to rely on theorists that tell us what happens when you take hydrogen to such high pressures. Now, we have um, taken um, hydrogen to uh, a, a couple million, a, to a couple megabars, a couple million times the pressure in this room. And what we know is that molecular hydrogen which is two protons and two electrons, right, in a molecule. What happens is when you get to very high pressure, you break those apart and the protons and the electrons can move around separately. Okay, so once you allow positively charged protons to move around, negatively charged electrons to move around, you can now drive electrical currents through that fluid. Okay? And so we move to, hydrogen turns into what we call a metallic phase uh, where it becomes electrically conducting. And so in many ways, deep inside Jupiter, we think this transition happens somewhere about 80% of the radius of Jupiter, uh, much deeper down in Saturn because of the lower mass. Um, it turns into something like liquid mercury that you have in your thermometers, right? So a liquid metallic material at fairly high pressures. So 
this is the story and this is the cartoon that we started off when we launched Juno. And we thought, well, we'll look inside. Are we going to see a core inside of rock and maybe ice materials with the hydrogen around the outside? But you know what's happened is the current idea is that in the time since we launched in 2011 and now, the theorists are beginning to say, yes, but when I do my quantum mechanical models, and, you know, I nearly put in on a German accent because it turns out the guy who does this as a is, is a quantum mechanics guy, is, is, is German. And I think a lot of us think of 19th century physics and the early quantum mechanical people having German accents. So I can't help thinking in a German accent <laughs> when I talk about this. Um, but uh, we have quantum mechanical models of, of uh, hydrogen at these very high pressures. And we thought originally that, you know, that there would be a core inside of those heavier elements those bits of iron and nickel and 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 uh, sulfur and and so on, oxygen and and carbon deep inside, um, but they're now saying that once you get to these high pressures, you just have metallic hydrogen, and all of the heavier elements become dissolved in that uh, liquid metallic hydrogen, and they will be just be sitting around as separate elements and it would be all mixed up, and you won't have a special core, a distinct core. So this is the sort of picture we're thinking about now. Is it like this, where you have something a bit more like a Easter egg, where you've got multiple layers? Or do you have a more mixed up... I've got to think of the name of the chocolate. There's probably some kind of chocolate that I could describe that looks like this inside. But, you know, is it more mixed up with the heavy elements being mixed up rather than a concentration deep inside? So this is what we're trying to sort out um, by measuring the magnetic, sorry, measuring the gravity field uh, will tell us about the distribution of mass inside and maybe the flows inside. That's why we want to measure the gravity. Um, the other thing we want to measure is the magnetic field because this liquid metallic region uh, will be turning over and we'll have a dynamo. And we expect there to be a strong magnetic field inside and what we really want to do by flying over and through this environment is, a t is to measure the magnetic field of Jupiter. We have some idea about the dynamo structure inside, but we really don't know uh, what the flows are and what are the flows that might be driving it. This is from a model, but it's just the outer layers. What's it really like deeper down? So we're going to do the same sort of thing with the magnetic field as we do with the gravity field, measure the power as a function of complexity or scale. And what's interesting is, when we do this with the magnetic field of the Earth, what we see is that we can measure this out to quite high order, something like about uh, 11 or 12. Uh, and we, But the problem then is, because the Earth has a crust that can be magnetized, the rocks of the outer layers of the Earth can be magnetized, the outer, the most detailed structure that we have at higher order, the higher level of complexity in the magnetic field of the Earth is all in the rocks, in the outer layers. It's got nothing to do with the internal dynamo. So once we look to higher order structure, we're not learning anything about the dynamo. With Jupiter, because we don't have a crust, we don't have uh, rocks that are magnetized in the outer layer, we hope that we will continue measuring the complexity to quite high order, maybe as high as 20 or so, that will tell us about the dynamo. And we'll perhaps know more about the dynamo of Jupiter than we do about the Earth in terms of degree of complexity inside. Uh, we really don't know what it will be like. And depending on the scale of that uh, metallic region, we don't know what the extent is of the dynamo, how far out it goes. So this is what we want to do, um, measuring uh, we're going to fly over and get a sense of, is the flow inside sort of cylinders, which is one theory, or is it that the flow inside is in fact uh, more turbulent, more like the sun's dynamo, where everything is turning over in small structures. So we hope to find out what it's really like by measuring the magnetic field and the gravity. Okay, so that's the deep interior. What about the outer layers? What about the water? What are we going to do there? Well, we know in the outer layers we have these layers of cloud. Um, we want to measure the clouds and the distribution of water and ammonia. And 
we decided that instead of sending more probes, what we would do is to measure the microwaves that come from the inside. Now, you all know that microwaves are absorbed by water. That's how you heat up your cup of tea in, in the microwave oven, right? You put your water in there, you turn it on, and the water heats up. It's the same sort of thing we think is happening. The deep interior of Jupiter is really hot. It's retained heat of formation, and that heat leaks out, and we want to measure that. We want to measure the amount that's absorbed by the water clouds and the ammonia clouds, and so we're going to measure at six different wavelengths of microwaves between uh, 1 and 0.3 centimeters and 50 centimeters, so wavelengths sort of in this range, and this will let us get a measure of the distribution of water. So we have these six different microwave antennas. The spacecraft is going to be flying over Jupiter, spinning, and as it spins over, as it goes over the planet, um, we will be able to measure the outcoming radiation in microwave and measure at different wavelengths and will tell us what the distribution is of water and ammonia, uh, not only as a function of depth, but we also will be flying over in these strips and measuring the distribution relative to the clouds. And so how much uh, is, what is the distribution of water and ammonia as a function of, of both height and uh, latitude and longitude. And so this will help us get a sense of how much water is there inside of Jupiter and how is it distributed. Okay, so that's what we're going to do to give us the distribution of water. Now, we chose this orbit to measure the gravity field, the magnetic field, and the microwaves to give us the water and ammonia. But because we happen to be flying over the poles, we're going to be able to fly over a unique region which we, we have never flown before, and that's the magnetic field region, the magnetosphere of Jupiter. Jupiter's magnetosphere is huge. For comparison, here is the Earth's magnetosphere. The whole magnetosphere would fit within the planet Jupiter. Whereas with the Jovian situ situation, where the field is much, much stronger, we have a region, this bubble, this magnetic bubble around Jupiter, that extends up to a hundred times in the direction towards the sun and extends in a long tail away from the sun all the way out past the orbit of Saturn at 9 um, AU. So this is a really long tadpole-like thing, um, large volume. Uh, it's rot dominated by the rotation of Jupiter and it's filled up with sulfur and oxygen that comes from EO. Now, as Paul Schenk here will, I think, agree, EO is one of the most weirdest and exciting moons that we have in the solar system. It is volcanic, as Voyager found out. It has plumes of sulfur, sulfur dioxide, um, spewing out. There are hot regions shown in this infrared image. There's High resolution region shows there are up to 300 different hot volcanic regions. We look uh, a few months apart with the Galileo cameras and we see there's a complete area, not quite as big as Texas, but as big as regular states in the United States, like Colorado, <laughs> um, that, that are covered with new lava every few months or so. And so we know that this is a very active region. It's the most volcanic object in our solar system, 100 times more volcanic than the Earth. And so it's very active. All the water has been removed. And the sulfur and oxygen uh, that comes spewing out uh, actually becomes uh, escapes from the planet, becomes ionized, and trapped in the magnetic field of Jupiter. And you get this big torus that extends out, in fact, beyond interacting with Europa and Callisto to some extent. But this is a ultraviolet glowing um, donut of ionized gases that are trapped in the magnetic field. The magnetic field, like the Earth, uh, wobbles with a 10 degree tilt. And so you end up with this uh, wobbling around because of the uh, tilt of the magnetic field. So this ton a second of material that comes from EO fills out this magnetosphere and uh, it becomes accelerated in the magnetic field. And what happens is those particles 
eventually come bombarding down onto the atmosphere of Jupiter and produces the aurora. And if we look at Hubble Space Telescope data, and I've just got to show you some of these fantastic data from Hubble, where we have, these are like raw images or semi-raw images, but I think you get to see the dynamic nature of this aurora. You have a fairly static ring of aurora, and then in the center you have these bright spots, which we don't really understand why these are coming and going uh, occasionally. And then we also see, you will see a spot and a, a path. Let's wait for the right one to happen. And uh, here it comes, coming around. You can see, here it is up here. You can see, here it is down here. And um, it's a spot. There are actually a series of spots and a wake behind. And these auroras are associated with the moons, Eo, Europa, and Ganymede. Um, we've been looking for Callisto, but it's harder to find. Uh, and these are electrical currents that are produced in the interaction of the moon with the magnetic field and the trapped plasma. And those currents flow along the magnetic field into Jupiter's atmosphere, where they trigger these auroras and generate this light. And there's a lot of power <coughs> in that. And uh, these are millions of amps currents that are flowing along the magnetic field into the planet. So this is a very dynamic environment. Uh, we're going to be flying flying with the um, Juno spacecraft right over this region. And so what we'll be doing is we'll be um, flying over, we'll be measuring the charged particles that are streaming along the magnetic field, we'll be looking at the aurora, and we'll be um, trying to understand what is the connection between the particle environment, the magnetic field environment, and the aurora that we're seeing below. We've never flown through this region before at Jupiter. We have a good sense of what happens at Earth. We can test our ideas of the physics of how this works at Earth and apply it to Jupiter. Is it anything like the same, or is it totally different? So it'll be very important physics experiment, as well as understanding all this energy that gets poured into the upper atmosphere of Jupiter. So that'll be um, a very dramatic time for us to fly through this region. Okay, time to show you the spacecraft. <laughs> they actually let me go inside and have a look. Someone was, I had to dress up like this so that we keep the spacecraft very clean and, and don't get any human dirt onto the spacecraft. You see the engineers are all dressed up like that too. Um, someone stood next to me. I'm not an experimentalist, so they were really watching me very carefully. But I just went in and had my picture taken next to the spacecraft. I couldn't resist it. Okay, so let's look at the time-lapse movie. And they put it all to music, and you look at the time-lapse, and it goes on, and it's great. So the engineers, they 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 put a piece on, they diddle, diddle about with it, measure it, take it off again, diddle with it more, bring it back on again, diddle with it, put it back on. I'm trivializing it. This is a lot of work to make this spacecraft work, right? You know, it's a lot of work. And uh, it takes months, in fact, a couple of years to put this together. And, um, you know, it's a lot of work uh, with a lot of people um, putting it together. And you, you realize, yeah, a lot of people have put a lot of time and energy. It's probably about a thousand people for spacecraft, right? One of these relatively small science spacecraft. Um, to put this together and uh, you know they have tea breaks and they go off but you know they're working pretty hard <laughs> it's kind of cool okay time for launch let's let's skip ahead a little bit because that movie goes on quite a long time um, even with a time lapse so the spacecraft's all put together uh, we put it inside slap a fairing on put the stickers on um, take it out of the cape. <laughs> That's the most important bit, right? You're putting these stickers on. Um, take it out of the cape, put it on the top of the Atlas V, and um, then we roll it out, and we get the team in front, take the pictures. <laughs> okay, but um, Lockheed Martin put um, two cameras on the spacecraft somewhere around here, and so I'm going to show you the launch movie, and what you will see is looking down, uh, at, at Cape. Okay. Welcome, everybody. 
Glad you could make it this evening. Quick question. Is anybody exceptionally warm? And, and don't look at me because I, I just sweat. Okay. Let us see if we can turn it down a little bit. It gets kind of stuffy in here with all these people. This is fantastic. Glad you're here. Uh, my name is Andy Saner, as some of you may know. Uh, you're at the Lunar and Planetary Institute uh, here in Houston. Uh, and tonight is our, what is this? this, is our fourth presentation in our current public lecture series, uh, Exploring the Solar System Today and Tomorrow. Our final and fifth presentation will be on June 2nd uh, with Dr. Alan Tremor from here at LPI, giving us an update on where things are at with the Curiosity rover on Mars. <laughs> And he's going to talk about the tires, or the wheels, <laughs> I guess. So, so if you've been here, so okay. Welcome, everybody. Glad you could make it this evening. Quick question: Is anybody exceptionally warm? And, and don't look at me because I I just sweat. Okay, we will see if we can turn it down a little bit. It gets kind of stuffy in here with all these people. This is fantastic. Glad you're here. Uh, my name is Andy Saner, as some of you may know. Uh, you're at the Lunar and Planetary Institute uh, here in Houston. Uh, and tonight is our, what is this? This is our fourth presentation in our current public lecture series, uh, Exploring the Solar System Today and Tomorrow. Our final and fifth presentation will be on June 2nd uh, with Dr. Alan Tremor from here at LPI, giving us an update on where things are at with the Curiosity rover on Mars. <coughs> And he's going to talk about the tires, or the wheels, <laughs> I guess. So, so if you've been hearing about that, you're going you're gonna to hear some more of that at that time. Uh, a couple of things you may have seen on here I want to uh, just kind of reiterate. On May 9th, there's a transit of Mercury, which means you'll be able to see Mercury going across the face of the sun slowly, but you can see it. We're going to have a telescope set up at the Freeman, Freeman Branch Library uh, from 10 to noon that day, as long as it's not cloudy. Uh, so you're welcome to come out and see the transit as it's happening. It's kind of a cool, kind of cool little thing to see. Plus, you get to see the sun, which <laughs> up close. Bring your sunglasses. Uh, uh, one of our scientists, David Kring, who you've probably heard speak before, he'll be giving two presentations at the Houston Museum of Natural Science, May 24th and June 30th, as part of their lecture series out there. Uh, so if you want to, there's a flyer fed out front if you want to go see that. He's a good presenter, too. you got to buy tickets, but that's their thing, not ours. Um, but those should be good talks uh, if you want to be here. One's about uh, lunar exploration. The other one's talking about the threat of asteroid impacts. So a fun one and then a scary one to, to balance it out. Um, and on the flyer, it says that it'll be in the planetarium, and that's true. If you look at it online, it says it'll be in their big theater. We just found out recently that they're going to do it in the planetarium because they just overhauled the system and got this nice, great new system in there. So they're going to do it there instead. Uh, at the end of tonight's presentation, of course, we'll have a Q&A session. You can ask your questions if you have it. If you do, please raise your hand. There'll be two of us going up and down the aisles there with a the microphone. Uh, that's so, of course, we all can hear it, but we're also recording. We're also streaming live on Ustream, which we did uh, the last presentation. So again, manners, uh, I, I beg. Um, oh, and of course, whoa, <laughs> let's just do this. Uh, there's a reception, of course, following afterwards, chance to chat with uh, our tonight's speaker, Dr. Baganel. We're getting there. So let me just show you um, the Earth flyby. We, uh, we actually tested a lot of stuff, including going through safing, which it's good that we do it at, at Earth, not at Jupiter. Um, Recovered, learned a lot of lessons. Um, we, uh, we took a lot of pictures. This was a view looking up and you could see Juno flying by. And, but the coolest thing was that we got all of these amateur astronomers to dit, dit, da, da, send their radio signal up to, to Juno saying, hi, Juno. And, uh, um, Juno measured it and sent it back. So, um, it's kind of cool that we actually communicating with the spacecraft. Um, so this is what we're doing. We're on approach where we're, uh, the sun's over here on the right. And so as of today, we're somewhere around here. Okay. And we're on our way to rendezvous with Jupiter. Um, we are going to uh, come in pretty close and then we'll, <coughs> we'll fire the engines on the 4th of July and then go into, or what we're going to do is 
um, this is looking from the sun or from the earth. We'll come into approach. We'll do two 53-day capture orbits, and that'll give us a chance to do a couple of flybys into that really hazardous environment close to Jupiter, get a feel for it, check that we uh, Juno is doing okay uh, and can survive through that environment. We'll learn how the system works and so on. And then we'll get into our, uh, we'll do a, um, a period reduction maneuver and then go into these close in every two weeks. And, you know, we don't know how long we'll last. We hope to last for 30 orbits. Um, but like I said, if we only get 10, we'll, get, we'll learn a huge amount about the interior of Jupiter, the magnetic field of Jupiter, the um, distribution of water, as well as the aurora. Um, but, okay, the cameras. <laughs> <clears throat> so we're going to do something really cool. Um, this is really is an education public outreach camera. We will hope to do some science. Um, but what we're doing is we're um, going to put up on this website uh, a bunch of choices of where we're going to take the data and bring the data down with the camera. And people can go and vote on what their preference is. So we will go and look at the targets. If you want to look at the red spot, you want to look at a a little brown spot, you want to look at a big cloud that's going by, you want to look at whatever you want to look at. Um, but the other thing that's really cool is that um, there are already hundreds of pictures of Jupiter that have been taken by amateur astronomers that are already up on this website. And we're encouraging uh, people who are interested in, in doing data processing, a lot of image processing people in the amateur astronomy community. In fact, I'm reluctant to use the word amateur because these people are very proficient and very capable. Um, and it'll be great to combine the observations up close that we take uh, with Juno with the ones that they're taking from Earth of Earth uh, observations. And so this will be an exciting new way of doing science and involving the public in, our, in the science that we're doing. So we're on our way. Uh, we've only got a few months to go. Uh, we're really looking forward to understanding what's inside, where the water is. Are our theories of solar system form formation uh, have to be thrown out of the window and start all over again? Or is there the amount of water that we think is there? What is the distribution of material like inside? Are the quantum mechanical guys right and that there's heavy elements that are dissolved in the hydrogen and, and spread out? Or do we have a distinct core as shown um, by this cartoon? Thank you very much. Okay, I'm happy to take the questions. Somebody's going to run around with the uh, microphone, is that right? Okay, well, wait. this uh, woman here in the red. Thank Hang on a second. You wait for the microphone. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Is this on? Yep. So the orbit goes around and it precesses into the deeper part. How many orbits before it precesses back out into the slot? Oh, excellent. Excellent. So I showed you this idea that if Jupiter's here and we have go fast over the poles and then it goes out here and that this orbit begins to precess like this. Indeed, as you're guessing, it will in fact come around and come out the other side. Well, it's about a degree per orbit. And so, <laughs> 90 orbits to go vertical, 180 to come out the other side. So, <clears throat> chances of surviving that are pretty slim. The other problem is, we only have money for 36 orbits. <laughs> so, first we have to survive, then we have to ask for money. So, But we are planning to go into, at the end, into an orbit that would eventually degrade. So what we do is we bring down the closest approach a little bit so that after some time, and we're thinking thousands of years, it will eventually go into Jupiter because it must not hit Europa, right? We all know why. Because <laughs> we were told... <laughs> All these ones except for Europa, yeah, except no landings. Well, right. So the thing, of course, is that we we did look into the planetary protection uh, and the speed that Juno is moving at 
if it did hit Europa, it would basically vaporize. So I'm not too worried. It is not carrying plutonium, so it wouldn't sink through the ice. So the chance, it, it actually, it's pretty unlikely that we will hit Europa or anything will happen. Uh, it's an extremely low probability. But yes, there's a question over here. Do you want to, who's got the, where's the, oh, maybe I can do this. Yeah, let me give that to you. There we go. Thank you for the great presentation. I've had some sun. I'll speak very loud. Thank you for the <laughs> okay. great presentation. You alluded to the idea that Jupiter formed in the outer solar system, but if I understand correctly, the Nice theory would imply that it propelled itself out there. Is there something you can determine from the data that will support or refute the Nice theory? Okay, I'll repeat that question. So, um, the picture I showed um, of the solar system formation um, with that big disk and um, the snow line and Jupiter forming beyond the snow line and so on um, was the, the sort of a few decades ago and things have evolved in our ideas of solar system formation and um, there's still the idea that Jupiter and Saturn the next part of it was to say uh, Jupiter and Saturn form where they are more or less where they are, but Uranus and Neptune formed in close and then got kicked out. And I think that's now gaining a lot of strength. And maybe that new planet X that's been um, discovered by the Caltech guys could indeed be a third Neptune that was sort of Uranus and Neptune that was kicked out. So the most recent theory called the Grand Tack says, what if Jupiter formed probably where it is now, but it had an excursion going inwards and then went further out again. And I don't fully understand. I've heard one or two presentations on this. Um, the question is, would we be able to tell from just looking at the interior of Jupiter? I don't think that we can take um, the thousands of computer models that people have done and say it's this one, not that one or that one, right? Um, but what we will be able to do is to say, this class is clearly not going to work, and this class has a hope of working from looking at the distribution of water. At least that's my expectation. Could be completely wrong. If we don't find any water and there's no oxygen inside Jupiter, then, you know, I really don't know where we go. But, I mean, getting some sense of that number will constrain it. Uh, also getting, I think, some of the other elements will be important because it's not as simple as that original picture. People are now talking about pulling in different parts of the uh, periodic table in different ways. And um, I think we'll build up a much better, we'll have a much better knowledge after, but I doubt we'll pin down, it'll be the last word in solar system formation. But it's all getting very interesting. It's not as simple as we thought it was, you know, a few decades ago. Another question. Um, okay. You're going to give this man a microphone? No. Oh, <laughs> I'll just, I'll just talk. Um, I can repeat it. Not a lot of people are aware that we're actually going to try something very similar at Saturn soon. Oh, yes. And maybe you could uh, describe a little bit what's going to happen in the next, uh, starting late this year. Right. So Saturn, as many of you know, has been uh, had a, a spacecraft called Cassini that's been in orbit around Saturn since 2004. Or did I get that date right? And so it's a long time now. I mean, that's 12 years now. And in the next two years, um, they've changed the orbit of, of Cassini so that it will fly similarly over the poles again and through close to the equator. I think it's going to go, you know, perilously close to that ring plane or those rings. Uh, at least at Jupiter, we don't have to worry too much about the rings, uh, the ring plane region. Um, and we'll do similar measurements of the deep interior with the gravity measurements, the magnetic field measurements, as well as flying through the polar regions of the aurora. And so it's going to be extremely valuable to compare these two giant planets, one that's a 100 Earth masses, uh, Saturn, and one that's 320 Earth masses, Jupiter, and see what the relative comparison is about their interiors. We do know that their interiors are different, uh, but how different they are is going to be very interesting and uh, make these comparisons. So comparative planetology is always the game uh, of planetary science, and it's going to be great that we're going to have these two happening in the same epoch. So yeah, it's our uh, next couple of years are going to be really interesting for giant planets. 
Okay. Just quickly, since you only have funding for 30 orbits, but our electronics do marvelous things, are you going to try to get funding for the 181st orbit to see if it just <laughs> might wake up again? Let's get, let's first get into orbit. JY, we'll do it one step at a time. Um, this young woman here had a, had a, had a hand up too. So let's. Yeah. Uh Oh, I'm Louise. I'm author of The Speed of Light. Uh -huh. And what's the latest thinking on why Jupiter gives off so much radiation that's so much more than receives from the sun? Okay. And how can it keep spinning so fast after billions of years? Right. So, so we have to be careful when we use the word radiation. Um, uh, when all of what I've been talking about so far has been about particles, um, uh, protons, electrons, uh, ionized sulfur and oxygen uh, that's trapped in the magnetic field. But I also mentioned the fact that it's hot inside and it's radiating out. And that radiation is in the form of photons. And I was talking about microwave photons coming from the interior and infrared photons coming from the interior. Uh, and so that is the heat that comes from the interior. And in fact, Jupiter radiates two and a half times the amount of energy that it gets from the sun uh, out in the form of heat. And so it's hot inside. And the main reason why it's hot inside is because of the heat of formation. You take 320 masses, of the Earth masses, and you pull that all together. That's a huge amount of gravitational potential energy that you convert into heat. And it takes a long time to cool off. The way I describe this to my astronomy students is it's a bit like um, Jupiter being a big fat baked potato and the Earth being a pea. And um, it's about the right scale in terms of size. But of course, what you're interested in is the volume to surface area ratio. And that really scales with the size. So when it's big, it retains all its heat, remains hot for a long time, like a big fat baked potato. And so Jupiter, which is the big fat baked potato, of course, retains all its heat inside. It gains extra heat when it forms and, it and keeps it for a lot longer. And so it's really just heat of formation as well as a little bit of radioactivity and differentiation and so on. But it's mostly the fact that it's big that means it radiates a lot um, in the form of heat. Yes, yeah, you can do fairly straightforward calculations of, of, of for doing that, and um, it's just left over from formation. I mean, there's still some heat of differentiation and, and radioactivity, but that's mild, mild compared with formation. Why is it spinning? Well, when it collapsed, it conserved angular momentum and kept kept spinning. Um, and it, it has a lot of spin momentum. Um, there's not a lot to slow it down. Um, it's not interacting with other objects. It's hard for other objects that are not anything like as massive as it to have um, uh, torques on it. So there is a little bit of interactions, gravity between the moons and Jupiter that is slowing it down a little bit. Um, but it's uh, pretty slow. It's got a lot of angular momentum in that spinning big 320 Earth masses. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, nope, nope. <laughs> Far away. Yeah. You, good. Yes. Um, did uh, Juno and the recent missions of Pluto and Cassini and how NASA has been uh, lately been the process? I hope so. I hope so. Um, you know, I've given dozens of public talks related to Pluto, and the enthusiasm is huge. I mean, I think it's just totally cool what we're finding. I thought it was going to be really kind of boring, to be really honest with you. And then I look at the surface, particularly the geology, and I'm going, <laughs> yeah, who ordered that? It's just really mind-boggling what we're finding and seeing. And I think people really are inspired and excited. Um, and what I would like to see is that we send robots, and we can get into the robot versus non-robotics some other time, but I think what we should do is send robots off all over the solar system and then bring all the data back and then give every kid gloves and goggles so they can go and explore our universe, our solar system, using the data from those robots 
all over space. I think it would be fantastic. Let's just send hundreds and hundreds of small sats all over the solar system and find out what's out there. I think it'd be great. And I think there's some enthusiasm for that. And emissions are getting cheaper. Actually, we're learning to do things more affordably. So the Juno mission and the New Horizons missions are part of the New Frontiers line, which are about a billion dollars per. So over 10 years, that's a cafe latte per taxpayer. <laughs> it's cheaper than the popcorn you paid for when you went to see the Martian. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not go there. <laughs> I'm going to let you do the control of the questions. I um, kind of following up on that question, you know, after Juno does bow out to radiation after hopefully 30 orbits, the outer solar system kind of will be going dark for a while. So maybe talk about, you know, are you concerned about the future of planetary science with kind of the scarcity of, of missions to the outer planets after Juno? I think that we will go to Europa. Uh, that's the next next one on the docket. I think we'll do that. Um, we've come up with good plans of how to do that, how to do that in a viable way. It's a difficult mission. But I think we all want to know what is underneath that ice, what that black, that brown gunk is. Is it whale poop? <laughs> you know, we want to know what what's there. And um, I think we can do a viable mission that is affordable, um, that's that's you know, somewhere between Juno and Cassini, maybe geometric mean of those two, we can do it in a portable way. Uh, I think that we have huge capability of doing these things um, with robots that are amazing. So we just, I, I'm not so pessimistic. I think, yes, we, if you look at the dates, it takes a long time to get to the outer solar system. You've got to be patient. Um, but I think we'll be, we'll be at Europa before too long. We'll go to other places. So, so I want to ask you, you saw all the Pluto pictures, which are absolutely amazing, right? Now, but do you think we should go to Pluto again, or should we go to Eris or Maki Maki or Homoea? What do you think? Should we go to the other type of objects, or do you think we should go to Pluto again? What do you think? Asteroid belt? Yeah, we're going to the asteroid belt. We've got lots of missions going to the asteroid belt. Uranus, Uranus and Neptune, absolutely. Okay, so we're going to learn about the giant planets with, with Cassini and with Juno. But what about Uranus and Neptune? Ha, those are very interesting. Those things that have a lot of water inside them, we think. We know there's water and ammonia and methane in those. They do not have metallic hydrogen inside. They do have magnetic fields, so they seem to have ocean dynamos. It's a really strange, different environment. What about those moons? What about Triton? There's a whole business of people now thinking about, well... If, if Triton is the captured Kuiper Belt object and it looks so different from Pluto, what happened to Triton that didn't happen to Pluto? So there's, a, there's going to be a whole bunch of papers, people looking at those. Maybe Paul's going to write half of them. But we'll find out what's, what's going on. So yeah, absolutely. I totally agree. I think there's plenty of places we want to go. And, uh, we'll go there. We'll go there. Any other questions? Or are we, I'll let you, you need to, the man with the microphone. Oh, yeah. A real quick question about the uh, metallic hydrogen in yeah. the center of Jupiter. It's in a magnetic uh, environment uh, with the sun. Is that a potential dynamo that's actually generating? It's a superconductor. Right. So it's, is that a, a dynamo that, that is may be the, producing energy, actually? Well, what's happening is that the, the internal heat is turning it over, and you've got rotation of the spin. Uh, and those are the ingredients that you need to make a magnetic field. And we know Jupiter has a very strong magnetic field. So it's a magnetic dynamo that's generated in the metallic hydrogen. In the same way, the Earth's dynamo is in the uh, liquid metallic iron that's deep in the outer core of the Earth, which has internal heat, turning it over with a bit of spin, and you make a magnetic field. Um, now, I know we need those three ingredients actually making it work, is a lot harder, and our dynamo models are fairly crude right now. But certainly it seems to be if you have those three ingredients, you do make a magnetic field. And the details we will learn. Now, I put this up here because I thought someone would want to know about the Great Red Spot. Do you want to know about the Red Spot? It's getting smaller. Isn't this cool? 
So if you look at the top left, that was the Voyager data. It was about 22 degrees of longitude. So that's about three times the size of the Earth. And it's been getting smaller. These are Hubble Space Telescope pictures and uh, um, Galileo pictures. It's getting smaller. And if we project further, what we see is at the time of Juno, it should be somewhere around, I think it's about at 12 to 14 degrees in size, so half what it was at the time of Voyager. And uh, maybe by 2050, it will disappear. Or do you think it'll come back? What do you think? Go away? I mean, we've known it's been there since the 1600s. How can it disappear in our lifetime? <laughs> we don't... Well, it must have been back then. It must have been comparable to the Voyager size, if not bigger. Yeah, yeah. We'll take Couldn't one resist. more question. We're tossing that one out. To this one. To a layperson, it would seem that using the, the process you explained, that the mass distribution or gravitational distribution would look the same to Juno, whether there is a rocky core, very small, or a point source, if you will, versus distributed matter um, throughout. How can you tell the difference? Um, well, you can. Uh, you you look at those. Uh, it's not spherically symmetric, partly because of the oblateness. Okay, so you're breaking some of the symmetry there. Um, but also, we think that the inside, there's actually cylinders, right? So then you've got flowing around the outside, which causes, and the higher the structure, it, well, it's not clear how uniform it is, right? And then um, the question of, I, I don't know how well we're going to determine the actual detailed variation in density with radius deep down inside. I think we will be able to tell if there's a distinct discontinuity, a sharp boundary between the core. Um, it's really hard when you've got that large amount of mass. The core is only, you know, 15, 20 Earth masses when you've got a 320 Earth mass object. So it's it's a little hard to get it super accurately, but I think we'll do enough constraints on the density and and distribution um, to constrain um, that pretty well. The big question here is knowing the equation of state, the relationship between density, um, temperature, and pressure, and that depends on the material and understanding the material. And so I think the physicists will have to work with the data and, and we'll iterate on this with those quantum mechanical models. And our gentleman with the, with the German accents will help us sort this out. <laughs> and, uh, it, 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 science is an iterative process. We won't solve it all in one go. Despite what we wrote in the original proposal for NASA. <laughs> Truth right, let's be told. Thank Dr. Benegal one more time. Okay.